Oh, okay. That broke. All right. So, um, as far as being a testing, uh, testing, ah, um, what's uh, my thread now? Testing, um, testing platform. Uh, one of the first things you do when, when you want to run Archelion is to select some type of container that you're going to run against. That could be some of the examples here being a Tomcat uh, instance, a Wildfly instance, or a JBoss uh, EAP, or Glassfish, or whatever. That's the, kind of the target environment that you want to run this, this or these tests against. Or it could be a remote thing like an OpenShift instance. And then when Archelion starts up, it will then connect and communicate with that, that container. And uh, based on how you set up the test, it will then start to deploy the, the, um, the deployment that you have defined, the target, the, the scope of this test, essentially. The app, application that you want to test that's being deployed to the, to the target environment, along with a bunch of Archelion things. And then you can then move the whole test execution over into that runtime instead of, instead of having it uh, or only having, uh, having it run inside the Eclipse IDE. Now you have the advantage of actually being inside, inside the runtime that, that you want to, to, um, to test. That gives you the advantage of actually having access to all the things that, that runtime provides like uh, security managers, uh, entity managers, data sources, uh, JMS connections, and all of those type of standard things. And when Archelion then is done running the in-container test, it can then move the test results back over to the client side and everything looks like, like it were if you run, ran a normal JUnit test. And then of course it cleans up the environment. So that's the basic what, what Archelion, uh, Archelion as we know it from the Java EE space does. And this is what a, the JUnit version of that test would look like. So you have the, the JUnit uh, extension point that says hand over the execution process to the Archelion, Archelion runner. At this point Archelion has control, it can do essentially whatever it wants. One of the first things it does is to look for that deployment annotated, annotated, annotated method and relies on a, on a library called shrinkwrap to bundle up whatever you want to, to deploy to this uh, application server. So you can add the classes, packages, files, uh, full jars, you can resolve them for, from the Maven, uh, Maven repositories and so on. Then it attempts to reuse the uh, the component models that exist in that environment that you're targeting. In this case, we're using CDI, so we can inject back the live beam that is actually being deployed and running in the server. It's not a mock, it's not a proxy of some sort, it is the actual thing that the server operates on. And then you come to the test method, and the test method executes as any normal JUnit test, essentially. You, you get the values and you assert on the state. That results in that. That result is then being handed back down, down to the client. Uh, that was the in-container version. This is the client-side version. There's kind of two points. There's the interest of, of being in the environment that you want to test, and then there's the point of being on the outside of the environment because you have remote entry points like a JXRS service or a um, remote EGB or HTML pages or whatever. The only difference from Archelion point of view is that you then set, set that a deployment is not, or is testable false. And so Archelion won't do anything besides deploying this for you, and then you're up and running. And then you can, as we're using here, we're using the um, uh, rest assure library to communicate with one of our rest services. So to set it up, um, for those who used Archelion in the past uh, and a bunch of the extensions, we know that it's a bit complicated to know what works and what doesn't necessarily. So we started something called the Archelion Universe bomb, which includes all of the different, uh, all of the different extensions and tr try to align the different versions so that everything should work together. 
So instead of relying on the Archelian bomb, you can now rely on the Archelian universe bomb. And you just follow the same pattern, being org Archelian universe, and then the name of the module or extension. So in this case, we want to use the Archelian J unit integration, but it could be the test and G integration, it could be the cucumber integration, the Spock integration, or any of the other, um, other test frameworks that we support. And then, in this case, we're using the chameleon uh, container, which is the con a proxy container, essentially, to allow you to, to call all the other containers. So there's one dependency to include all of uh, the different JBoss versions and the different Glassfish versions and so on. So let's see that up and running. That's the basis of Archelian. So this is the same test that we were seeing on the slides, the in-container version. And as far as it's being configured, uh, we can see in the palm here that it's just relying on, on the universe bomb. Oh, yeah, it's a bit small maybe, but and uh, the cam chameleon driver. Let's see, and it's defined in the Archelian configuration file that this should be running on a Wildfly 9 managed server. And some of the features of Chameleon is that as long as you haven't defined where this server is, it will actually download it and, download it and extract it for you. It makes it easy to, to demo, essentially, and to, to run from uh, CI systems and so on. So since this is just a JUnit test, the only thing we need to do is to right-click and say run as JUnit. Run as JUnit. It's starting up the server, deploying the application, and you got a green bar. You can look through the log and see what's happening, but it's not that interesting. Um, do people understand the conceptual of what our Killian normal does? Any questions around that? Maybe it's asked the other way. Is there anyone who, who understands it at all? <laughs> Two, three, okay. Uh, all right, I can explain more. Um, so what Archelian does in the background here is kind of the first steps that we looked at. So as far as you have defined Archelian, it will then look for the deployment, it will start that container that you have uh, configured, which is, uh, in this case, the, the Wildfly container. We start that as part of the test, um, the test hive cycle. Then it will deploy the deployment, and then it will move the whole execution of the test over into that container. So you're running inside that container. Now, that's the wrong test per se, but this one. Uh, we could actually, for the fun of it. Uh, let's see. Let's start up a Wildfly server uh, outside of Archelian's control and then change it to use the remote adapter so they will communicate with some existing, existing server. And we can uh, debug that server. And let's see, when we then run the in-container test, we can set a debug point on the uh, inside the test method and see where that actually ex executes. If we rerun that. See, it's not starting it up anymore. Wait. Ah, come Then we have a breakpoint, and we can see the, um, 
uh, the actual breakpoint, the stack of it, maybe a bit hard to see, but it's coming in from uh, the HTTP server on the wildfire side. So it's actually not executing in the IDE, but the, the request is forwarded and, and executed in the remote environment. And then it's being passed back back to the client, so it will see and feel like it was executed as a local test, regardless of it, of it being executed either in uh, Eclipse or in uh, maybe in Surefire or whatever. So, oops, let's shut that down again. That's trouble. So the, the principles around Archelian in general is um, the, the test case itself shouldn't have any information about where this is running. It should only define what it needs, needs to run. That to be able to create portable tests in the sense that they, they can swap between the different environments. Uh, you have the same test case or test suite run on both uh, Classfish and Wildfire. And, and see that they work in the, in the same locations. Uh, and it's going to execute for, from wherever you want it to, uh, being an IDE or, or Maven Surefire, for instance, or Cradle or whatnot. Some of the big problems that we were trying to solve was the, uh, the big, big integration test suite type of thing where you end up uh, writing a test, going to Maven, having to build the whole thing that can take an hour, and then you're going to have one hailing test. So we wanted to be able to be in the IDE and just code the test and run that single test as, as if you would a normal unit test. And um, we achieved that some, uh, somewhat through the, the use of the shrink wrap hybrids, which can uh, use the incremental compilation that happens in the IDE and just package up the stuff instead of having to, to, to go through the whole Maven build. And we call it a testing platform instead of a testing library because it's really what it does is just to manage the life cycle of different things you put on top of it. So it manages the life cycle of Selenium, for instance, through the drone extension. It handles the... Uh, life cycle of containers with the container extension. Uh, and it can be used from multiple different uh, testing frameworks, or it can be used as a standalone thing outside of a testing environment. And it's built to be flexible and extensible in the sense that we wanted, we don't know what, what libraries or component models we need to support today, or we need, we, need to, we know which ones are here today, but we don't necessarily need which one, know which one come tomorrow. So, so it, it's built around extensions and, and enrichers, so, so the platform can kind of stay the same, and you can just kind of evolve it along as a modular system. So we're going to see, look at one of those extensions today, which is Archelian Cube, which is the uh, extension that operates and, and controls the life cycle of, of Docker containers, which is the, the basis of this talk, essentially. <coughs> so Cube is, <coughs> as I said, or, said already, it, it manages the life cycle of, of a Docker container or multiple containers. And it has some magic, so you can either use just the Docker containers as is, uh, or you can map up a container adapter from the Java E world on top of, uh, on top of a Docker instance, and Cube will kind of handle all the IP addresses and port mappings and all of that stuff for you. So you just say, on that Cube there is a, a JBoss server, and then Cube figures out the rest. And of course, you can operate multiple uh, containers at once and then, and then kind of orchestrate how they run together, how they're started, and when you want to stop them, etc. And it's not just built around the idea of being an application server inside a Docker image, uh, but it can be used with any 
library, anything that starts a port, essentially, any l language. So Drop Wizard, Spring Boot, Netty, Node, Vertex, uh, Bash scripts, I mean, whatever you want to make. To cube, it's just a Docker container. So, so we're going to look at the first uh, the first test. Um, um, kind of some of the premise of this talk is to see how we can use uh, Docker to enhance our current testing techniques, as well as um, how we can test in general Docker stuff. So the first uh, the first uh, test here is a simple. Um, Wildfly-based Docker image uh, that is custom-made and opens up all, all the management ports and so on. So we're going to use Docker as a, I don't know, as a, it's not a pre-configured image, but we're going to change the state. So it just starts up a Wildfly server, and we're going to be deploying into it, as as we were, as we were doing in, in in the other example. But this time we're going to do it through through Docker instead. So the test case itself, uh, we're also going to use an extension called uh, the Archelian Persistent Extension, which helps you deal with um, database uh, data, essentially. So you can say, before this test method starts, we're going to insert this HAML file with data and make sure that the state of the database is correct. And then we're going to execute this, this different uh, JPA, JPA queries against it and see that the results are, are as expected. Uh, the only thing you have to do when you're using the universe uh, bomb to get Docker in there is to add the Archelian cube Docker dependency. And to the persistence is Archelian persistence. There's a pattern here and how they fix the name, and then are getting chameleon. So this is the, the um, Archean XML file when you're using Docker, uh, or sorry, the cube. Uh, there's an extension uh, section for Docker. Uh, in the minimalistic, there's a bunch of rules. They will, if you don't uh, define anything, it will try to figure out where it might run this thing. So if there is a, if you're on a, Linux box, it will look for the Linux um, Unix Unix Docker socket. Uh, if there's a Docker machine up and running, it will see if there's only one running and that kind of thing. So it tries to kind of figure out where, where it should run. But in this case, we're telling it to run on the on the on the Docker machine that's called dev. And then there's a definition of the image. So there's an image called Filefly, we're going to use the Docker file that is loca located within, within our uh, project structure to build this file. Uh, no, sorry, to, to build this image as, as a part of the test run. And then there's a couple of port bindings, fairly standard Docker stuff. Uh, Due to how Wildfly works with the authentication mechanism and so on, uh, you have to set up some user as long as you're not running on the same host. So that's why these two are there. But as far as the chameleon configuration, it's just telling it that it's going to use a Wildfly 9 remote adapter and combination of cube and the Docker integration will then set the IP address that it's going to use and and look at the port bindings, for instance, that you have remapped the default 8080 port to be 8081 and kind of update all of that configuration for you. So let's see how that looks. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, right. So this, uh, as far as the JPA part of this uh, test, it's going to run against the uh, default installed H, what was it called? Uh, the default database, example database, what is it called? H2, H2. H2 thank you. H2 and nothing else. So, so, it's all, so, so it's all internal and all inside the same image. Uh, test case itself doesn't really, uh, is that the right one? Oh, 
here. So in that case, it's the same as we saw. Um, can just do run as jlint. And now, if I find a little window here, you should see here, well, it's unclear now, but now we're inside the pdev docker machine, and we can see that the wildfly image has been started up. It's been up for nine seconds, uh, and there it's starting to run the test. And we should see the Docker image go away. And boom, gone. So that's the, the most simple version of, of Cube. You have starting up some existing container in some existing Docker image, uh, building the image when it starts up to match your, you can look at that as well. Um, as we defined here, we had the Achillean uh, XML pointing to our local folder here that has all the Docker file and what that's needing. Uh, well, essentially just setting the password and then closing the ports. May I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the file that, uh, 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 mm hmm The, the format that you saw here was was our own essentially. It's uh, loosely based around uh, uh, Fig and uh, how the uh, the variables that the Docker serve it, uh, service rather that takes in that essentially what that that's based on. But, but we do also support the compose compose format. The compose format came after we started that thing. That's why that's not the, the default option at the time. Can test runs without disposing the ports? Um, no. No. Um, you technically could. They would only work on the local host, essentially, because in a normal remote machine, you wouldn't see the the, the, the container's IP at all, most likely. Uh, but running on local hosts, you could do that. You could configure configure it to run directly on the container without going through the hosts, I believe. That's possible. So uh, I'm going to look a bit in, on the orchestration part of it. Um, that means several dependent, uh, dependent Docker containers that needs to be started. And some of them needs to be started up, up in a different hive cycle than what the, uh, the uh, test container is going to start up in. And you can compose them, compose them based on different uh, templates that kind of extend, ex extend each other. So uh, as far as JPI part of this, we're going to use this time. We're going to use Wildfly. It's going to be the same test case, at, test, test case as we saw before, but this time it's going to be configured to run against a MySQL instance instead, which then is two different Docker containers. Um, configuration doesn't. Ch I mean, the basic is still the same. Uh, there is now a property that we have exposed that says auto start containers. Um, you can put an expression there to say which of the defined containers here, either the Wildfly or MySQL latest that you want to start up before, uh, essentially before anything else happens. Um, and then we are adding a link so that the containers can kind of see each other based on the name. 
based on the property there uh, that you see, say which one you're going to auto start. Uh, you can have multiple different MySQL images, f for instance, that have a link. Uh, no, so, so it could be a MySQL 5, it could be a MySQL 6, it could be a Postgres. Uh, and just based on swapping on which one you start first, essentially, uh, is what will define which link the, link the Wildfly server will see and which database you will be running this t test against. Uh, yeah, and that allows you to, to fairly easily um, spawn out multiple different tests over multiple different database uh, servers and so on, which is an interesting thing. So, um, right, uh, to your point, I guess, or to some of it, um, that format is the Archelian cube, cube format, loosely based on FIG and, and some other uh, options, but it looks fairly similar to how the Compose format looks, so we also support the default Docker Compose format. So you could, I mean, that would be the, that would be the version of, of the same configuration, but done in the Docker Compose format instead. And you just define that you want the definition format to be compose. So look, let's look at that. So again, this is the same test that we saw before. Uh, we can just run as. And we should start to see some. MySQL container starting, Wildfly starting. Mm. There we go. Dum -dum 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 -dum. Green bar. <coughs> That was with two containers, just uh, splitting up the same, same example as, as we had before, but now over two containers and, and cube dealing with both of them and should have stopped both of them as well. Mm, any questions around that? Yeah. Mm, well, uh, you could, um, let's see, you could technically in this file, you can uh, define instead of this property, you can say MySQL, for instance, and then you can say Wildfly. Uh, but if you just say, um, uh, I can in cube, when it tries to determine this order, it will look at the, the links and so on as well. So it will start things in parallel if it can, but if it needs one to be started before the other, then it will, yeah, make sure that MySQL is up and running before the Wildfly one starts. For instance, uh, basically based on the, which containers links to which, essentially. That's how it figures it out. Um, okay, that was orchestration. Containerless. So containerless is um, what um, a, a, a Archelian container is, but for a Docker. So you can deploy Docker images, you can deploy templates, you can deployed into a Docker host, essentially. Um, and that's where all the other alternative languages and, and, and servers come in. So you define that to be the kube containerless uh, extension. You want to add that. This is our JavaScript application. Just has a simple REST API, not too fancy. And then in the same fashion, we have the deployment method, but in this case, we're actually deploying the Docker definition instead of a Java application deployment to an app server. Uh, and beyond that, we, we kind of have the same testing uh, abilities moving down. So there's a Docker template it's, instead of a Docker file. And I think the only variable we support per now is the deployable, uh, deployable file name, which is the content, or which is the tar file that's the output of that, that deployment method. 
So if you want to dynamically build up some kind of uh, uh, files to be added and automatically build as part of the suite. So now you can sit and hack in the IDE. You can make changes, make changes to the uh, JavaScript application, start up, and, uh, start up the test case. The uh, image will be built with the uh, JavaScript files on the IDE and then start it up. And yeah, that's essentially the same as far as the configuration, except that now you have a containerless configuration instead of the um, chameleon one we saw before. And the cube format is the same. Just to see that runs as well. Uh, hmm. Does the npm install? No, ah, we don't already. Oh, there is an npm start, right? And here we're done. All right. So that's just a pure JavaScript application, as opposed to a Java app server or anything like that. So that could be a Python application. It could be whatever. Uh, running a bit short on time. Whatever now, two minutes or something? Seven minutes. Oh, seven minutes, okay. So I'm going to drop the last demo and I'm going to show something that's brand new. So new that it doesn't actually work yet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some of the advantages when you have a, a um, containerized system and you're controlling all the servers, essentially, uh, all the different Docker containers, is that you can also start to fiddle with the network and you can do all of these kind of magical things that you really haven't been able to test very easily unless you have some kind of VM system. So um, the new extension to Kube is something called KubeQ. Q from Star Trek, also those who know that, is the entity that has control over all space and time and everything, right? So that's what a Q essentially does. Q uh, intercepts your normal uh, Docker composition setup and inserts proxies in every possible fashion. Um, so when you should have been reaching your container, you actually be communicating with the, the proxy and then it comes to your uh, container, then that container talks to another server, but there's a proxy in between. So now you have control over all the different endpoints. Um, so that allows you to do things like this, for instance. You can say Q, when this block of code executes, uh, make sure that server one, which is our, our container, any communication that happens on port 8085 will time out within five seconds. And then you can see, did my database driver actually handle that correctly? Did my um, REST service reconnect and so on? So uh, we can run this now just to see how that looks. It still just ran as a normal test case. Uh, it's a bit small probably, but you can see the original configuration on top. We have two servers. There's one server that communicates with the other. And then the, the proxy comes in and kind of overrides all the communication between them to go through itself. And then you can programmatically control uh, the communication flow between them. So we've got a connection he said exception because we told it to essentially do that. Um, but of course, you have other options on Q as well. So you have um, uh, you can set the bandwidth. You can uh, tell it to be just down. You can set the latency. Uh, you can sl slice up all the package into much s smaller bits, and you can have a very slow slow close, for instance, uh, either on the upstream or the downstream connection, that's kind of up to you. So that 
gives you an extra level of, of, um, of um, control. Uh, OK, we dropped that one, no time. Dum, 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 dum. So what's coming? Um, Kubernetes and OpenShift 3 support we have kind of uh, in the latest alpha releases. Um, more work we'll put into those. Uh, also around the core OS and Mesos as well. So Cube will be is essentially the Archelian um, abstraction that deals with anything Dockery and uh, the control over those. Uh, let's skip that one. So if there's any the next steps as far as figuring out what Archelian is and <clears throat> be a part of Archelian is to go to the Archelian org website, which has a lot of um, guides, etc. Or you can join the discussion on discussion.archelian.org. And any questions uh, are welcome, of course. If anyone have any? And yes, that's me. Um, <clears throat> what exactly? Uh, well, as far as the integration there now is, it's um, you can use the containerless container as we saw before. You can deploy a Docker image that you build or that you're creating locally, push that to the OpenShift instance, which will build that and start it up. That's one uh, uh, phase. And then the other one is to start and control pods, whichever pod you want. Uh, and yeah, and essentially do the same thing as you see here, or that you saw here, uh, is to some extent works in OpenShift 3 now. Uh, OpenShift 3 will also add on a bunch more stuff to it. So you have more control over uh, communicating through services, uh, setting up routes, and all that, those kind of features as well. But the basics as far as uh, starting up an image on OpenShift, starting up multiple images on OpenShift, doing the uh, the orchestration uh, parts of it, and also um, building something in OpenShift is also functioning as of alpha six or so. Oh, yes, scarves. Scarves, right. Scarves. Well, up. Yes. Not currently. Uh, we haven't done anything against the swarm yet. But that's, yeah, that's something to explore. Then we're out of time, so that was me. Thank you for coming and listening. Thank you.